You're listening to The Observing Eye. Pirate Radio for the Mind. Coming at you fresh from the computer hell cabin. Hello, you beautiful lot. It's Friday, the 6th of October, 2023, and this is episode 33 of The Observing Eye, coming at you live from the computer hell cabin. If you're new, welcome aboard, and if you're returning, welcome back. As always, I like to begin these episodes with a brief moment of reflection, so let's take a moment to consider the good things that have happened this week. And now a moment for the not so good. In this episode, we're going to be talking all about free will, the red pill versus the blue pill, a question that's been on philosophers' ages for centuries, if not thousands of years. They have wrestled with it eloquently. I shall wrestle with it not so much. Free will is a contentious subject. It pertains to the idea that us as individuals have the ability to make choices and decisions independent of external influence, constraints, or predetermined factors such as destiny or fate. In essence, free will suggests that we as human beings have agency and can act according to that agency in our own intentions and desires. Now, you may have come across there are numerous different perspectives on the idea of free will, which just makes it intensely more confusing. So let's take a minute to just run through some of those. Now, we'll start with the deterministic view. So this is like the old, the older kind of idea that comes from antiquity and says that that all events, including human actions, are determined by preceding events or laws of nature. In this view, free will is an illusion because every choice you make is the result of prior conditions. The hand of fate that guides us, essentially. Then we have the libertarian view, which is the exact opposite of determinism, and it argues that individuals have complete freedom to make choices that are not predetermined. So this is all about, you know, this is very, very angled towards the idea that free will exists and we have agency, unlike deterministic, which discerns that all action and agency is determined by fate or the gods or what have you. Then we have what's called compatibilism. So this is a bit of a midway idea that tries to unite determinism and libertarianism. And it argues that free will can coexist with determinism as long as we have the freedom to act according to our own desires and intentions, even if these desires and intentions are themselves determined. So it's kind of like, you know, free will. We think we have free will. We behave as though we do. We believe that we do. But also there is some like determinism and fate involved in that. It's an interesting one. I'm not entirely sure about compatibilism myself. I don't know, let's get further into it. We'll find out a bit more on what different types of free will and ideas of free will there are. So we have quantum mechanics. This is a new one from the early 20th century. So some theories suggest that the indeterminacy at the quantum level could provide a basis for free will. Now, this is a very, like, you know, this is where we get into metaphysics, and I do not like metaphysics. Uh, So we're going to, I'm going to park, I'm going to park the quantum mechanics idea, I think, for this uh, for this particular episode. And then we have religious views. So from the religious context, free will is a gift from a divine entity which allows us to choose our morality, allows us to choose between good and evil. And you'll see this in all sorts of religions where we have the capacity and the agency to choose our moral actions. So are we able to decide things for ourselves under our own volition? Or are we forced to exist on the tram lines where we believe that we have free will, but in fact everything is already predetermined? 
And I guess what's the what's the most comfortable idea? Some people may find the idea of being on the tram lines kind of comfortable because, you know, it takes away the responsibility, whereas others may feel a sense of personal liberty and that we should have the agency to decide for ourselves. But how do we tell the difference? You know, the, the observer can't observe itself. So what's going on? What's going on in the brain when it comes down to free will? So back in the 1980s, there was an experiment that was conducted by Benjamin Libe, who's a neurophysiologist at the University of California in San Francisco. Now, this experiment has been argued about, elaborated on, and numerously repeated ever since the original. Now, the setup is that we take a volunteer and we ask them to just sit with their hand on a button and we ask them to press that button after a random interval of time of their choosing. So the volunteers then ask to note by means of a timer the instant that they decided to press the button. Now, obviously, they've got like an, uh, an EEG and everything wired up to the brain. So we can see what's happening inside the neurons uh, when they make their decision. But what's interesting about Libé's experiment is that he discovered that people became aware of their decision to hit that button a fraction of a second before they actually pressed it. And what's interesting about this, uh, this revelation is that the part of the brain that controls hand movements, it started to, started to show activity before the person believed that they'd taken the decision. So it's about a third of a second difference between the brain firing up to move the hands to press the button and then the person deciding that they want to press the button. So the hand movement happens before the decision occurs in the brain. Now this really messed up the three will debate because it suggested that whatever is making the decision, it's not our conscious experience. Our conscious experience is interpreting the, the situation and it believes that it has made a choice, but something made the choice for us. Now, unfortunately, and not in the support of the idea of libertarian free will, there's some psychological research that tallies up with uh, Libé's experiment as well. So... We can essentially trick volunteers into thinking that they've made a certain choice that they didn't through, you know, clever psychological tricks and, and uh, experimentation. Uh, and when we do this, the volunteers are really good at, or their minds are very, very good at creating the narrative as to why they made that decision in the first place. Uh, it's, um, it's what we call confabulation. Of course, this wouldn't be a decent discussion about free will if we didn't talk about the the opposing ideas and the challenges to Libé's experiment. So there was a 2019 study that slightly adjusted Libé's experiment, and they asked subjects to make a more meaningful decision than just to randomly decide when a person is going to press a button. So... The 2019 study, they asked their volunteers to press a button to decide which of two charities would receive $1,000. As part of their experiment, they discovered zero brain rise in unconscious brain activity before people had felt that they had made that decision. So their argument is that Libé's experiment, Libé's findings, only applies when we're making arbitrary decisions and it's not relevant for deliberative decisions, so more involved stuff that we have to think about. So their argument is that because it's arbitrary, we don't actually care about it. So it just becomes like a autonomous and ran, you know, like there's no, there's nothing engaged behind it. But when we have a vested interest in something like you know deciding between two charities in the case of this experiment then there's more of a deliberate process of of thought involved and and the the conscious mind makes the decision 
There's a fair bit we can actually say from a psychological point of view on this as well, when it comes to how we make decisions and how we enact agency in the world. So obviously, the older we get, the more experience we accumulate. And the ex- past experiences that we have will determine our outlook and perception of things that we are experiencing in the present. So if we've had a, you know, a particularly bad experience around something and this similar event sort of raises its head in the present, then we will act in a certain way as a kind of defense mechanism so we don't experience that same thing again. And that will determine our choices. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have agency. It just means that we are acting to defend ourselves. You could argue there's a certain deterministic aspect to that because, you know, we are we are running kind of on autopilot because the brain is essentially defending itself from suffering. But, you know, if we really wanted to, we could choose to to act in an opposing way. And there is that thing, isn't there, where the, the mind will take the path of least resistance. So we will tend to do things in a in a similar way over and over again once we have defined that this is the way to do it because it means we don't have to consciously think about it. So again, there is a deterministic aspect to that. But I think possibly where I, I mocked I mocked slightly the idea of compatibilism earlier, maybe there is more to compatibilism than at first thoughts. Maybe there is a deterministic aspect to how we think and make decisions when it's arbitrary or when it's something that we do on a regular basis that doesn't require conscious thought. But when the consciousness is involved and it is a much more in much more complex decision that we have to make, then we can truly enact agency. Because why would we just want to take up capacity in the mind to think about that sort of stuff? And I think it's important to consider the brain, the mind, as a greater part of you know the body as well we can't just think oh the mind is a separate thing and then you know the body is is its own the as much as the consciousness is you know exists within within the brain and the neuroscience side of things you've also got all of the autonomous stuff as well that goes on there and you know you can't is that deterministic you know is the way that that behaves deterministic yeah it probably is because it's the same as the way that a machine would work you know there are deterministic ways that a machine will behave in certain contexts and the same for the mind the mind will behave in a certain way in certain contexts that could be considered to be deterministic but we've got to remember that the the primary job of which the brain is a part the primary job of the nervous system is to control and the consciousness exists within that system of control so there will be aspects of it that will appear to be deterministic. Now, that doesn't mean that there are certain decisions and actions and agency that we have that that isn't. Of course, you know, there, there may well be, and I genuinely believe myself without trying to give you any sort of confirmation bias, that we do have agency to choose, uh, to have free will, to have that moral accountability, to, you know, to have agency. But I also believe that there are certain aspects of our behaviours that will essentially be running on autopilot, uh, and that will be deterministic in a, in a sense that it comes from our previous experiences or external influence. So I would say it's a balance. It's a balance between having agency and free will for the things that matter to us and having a certain amount of like autopilot determinism for things that don't. Because why waste consciousness on pressing a button? What are your thoughts on the notion of free will? I'd love to hear some comments. You can go onto our Substack, which is theobservingeye.substack.com, find this episode and throw some of your ideas into the mix. Or you can find us on Instagram at theobservingeye. Uh, again, throw some throw some uh, comments some ideas around your thoughts on free will and we can start a bigger discussion around it i'd be quite keen to hear what all of you think that's everything i have to say on the nature of free will today 
As it's Friday, I always like to wish you a wonderful weekend. Perhaps you could ponder whether the things you decide to do this weekend are your choice or the choice of a deterministic universe. There's a quandary for you. Wishing you much love, and I will see you in the next episode. You've been listening to The Observing Eye. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I hope that you found it useful. And if you're interested in any more of my writings or work around psychology and philosophy and general day-to-day living, please go and take a look at my substack, which is theobservingeye.substack.com. And that's I as in the letter, not I as in each gelatinous organ through which you see. Take care, everybody. Much love. And I'll see you soon.